And what else is happening right now? In the past couple of years, have there been any new breakthroughs in cosmology? There's been a couple of severe crises in cosmology. And crisis is not a bad word. Crisis is horrible in politics and peace and <laughs> all sorts of <laughs> other things. I hate crises, you know, on a daily basis. But crisis kind of is what scientists live for. Because if you have a theory and it's completely understood, and it makes all these predictions, then effectively you're kind of like a stamp collector, or you know you're 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 doing you're doing important work, but it's uh, but it's it's not novel. It's not doing something that's never been done before. However, when you see something that doesn't fit into the prevailing wisdom, the scientific paradigm, the philosophy of the time, it's incredibly exciting. It's exhilarating to scientists, professors like me, because it means that we don't understand something. And so what we love to do is hunt for new explanations, new paradigms that people could not find before because the technology wasn't there. So an example, in, in the 1700s, Isaac Newton came up with his famous theory of universal gravitation, and that predicted the inverse square law, and he had to invent calculus, and, and he did incredible things, incredible works. What was almost as important as what it could predict namely that planets should move in elliptical orbits with the sun at the focus, et cetera, was that it had glaring gaps, flaws, lacunae, things it could not explain. And that led a young man in the 19, early 1900s by the name of Albert Einstein. I have puppets of everybody here. Here's Albert Einstein. Um, Albert Einstein to say, wait a second, there's something weird with your theory. Uh, it does predict things exquisitely accurately, and for example, it, it is able to solve a problem which it shouldn't be possible to solve. You've heard of the three-body problem. It's a famous book, uh, you know, yes. and, 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 uh, but it's also based on a physics problem, which is that if you have three masses, so here I've got a, um, one chunk of meteorite, uh, which uh, I give away, you know, I'll have, to, I'll have to ship it to people in India, but, uh, but one lucky winner a month wins one of these. Here's another meteorite. And then let's say it's circling, they're circling around me, but they're also interacting with each other. In general, the orbit is unpredictable. You cannot predict the orbits of just simple planets if there's more than two. That's a general principle. That's called the three-body problem. And what arises from it is called chaos. You have chaotic behavior where the behavior, if you, if you start the planet off at one location, you change it by a millimeter, eventually you get completely different orbits that we can't understand. But Einstein realized, wait a second, besides that, um, in certain simpler situations, say just the planet Mercury orbiting around the sun, ignore the, the Earth and ignore all the other planets, but just look at Mercury. It doesn't do what Newton predicts. And it, in fact, it's moving in an orbit, it's an ellipse, and every time it gets closest to the uh, to the sun, it's shifting a little bit every day, every year. <laughs> that elliptical orbit is precessing, and nobody could understand it. And Einstein said, "Wait a second. What if gravity not only affects space? It not only causes space to kind of curve and warp and and bend the trajectory of light, but it also shifts time." You see, Newton thought time was absolute. The time ran at a fixed schedule, no matter you here, me here, you in India, wherever. You and I had a coordinated clock that would always agree on every event. Einstein's theory of special relativity said that's impossible. You, can only, you cannot have two observers in different locations in space, moving at different velocities, have the same coordinated time. It's impossible. But they will agree on one fact, only one fact, that the speed of light is the same for you in India, in your laboratory, as it is for me in San Diego, California, in my laboratory. That's the only thing they'll agree upon. And he, he constructed the mathematical framework by which you could have a set of observers and what they would agree upon is only the speed of light. And in doing so, you had to sacrifice the absolute nature of time. The only way that could happen is if time and space were pliable, that they changed, that they were not fixed quantities. And that was his theory of special relativity. And then in 1914, he started to think, well, wait a second. If that's true, then we can't explain how Mercury is behaving. It's behaving in this weird orbit. The only way we could actually affect that is if gravity also affects space and time. <laughs> and when you do that, you find you not only can't constrain how clocks move in your laboratory, but you cannot in general do it throughout the entire universe. And so by doing this magical kind of mathematical manipulation, Einstein was able to derive and retrodict, 
if I say tomorrow, you know, uh, Modi's going to do something, you know, whatever, that's a prediction, right? But if I say, uh, now I understand why he did this in the past, that's a retrodiction. Now it's easier with people in some ways, harder in other ways. But with planets in the solar, it was easy to, uh, to understand, to collect this data and then apply it in reverse. And that would have been a tremendous accomplishment. That would have been one of the greatest accomplishments in the human mind. But Einstein then said, well, let me make predictions you should see the following thing happen. During a total solar eclipse, as we just had here in, in, Cal in America, we had a perfect total solar eclipse on, on April 8th. And when that happens, the sun is being eclipsed by the moon. When the moon passes in front of the sun, that allows you to see stars you can't see normally, like the light behind me. If I move it, if I'm the moon now, I block it out. There could be stuff behind me that you can't see because the glare is too bright. Einstein predicted that the stars behind the sun should bend by a tiny amount if the theory was true. And later it was proven that he was correct through experimental observations. So that was a tremendous accomplishment that no one had ever done before. And rightfully ended up earn, you know, getting him the notoriety and he won the Nobel Prize two years later. So this has had a long kind of you know, uh, impact on, on, on culture, on philosophy. And the same thing is happening with our telescopes like the Simons Observatory. We're really trying to revolutionize how does gravity affect the origin of space and how does it expand? So you asked me, what are the big crises in cosmology right now? One of which is that the universe is expanding, according to some, faster than it should be. And the speed of the expansion is inversely related to the age of the universe. That is, if I say you're moving away from me at 1,000 miles an hour, uh, but you're only really moving away at 500 miles an hour to get to some greater distance. That means you had to be expanding longer, right? You had to be traveling for a longer period of time at a slower rate to reach the distance that we see now. That's what's happening in cosmology. We have two different teams. They disagree violently. Each one says, I know my answer exactly, precisely to about 1% accuracy. And the other one says, I know the same thing, but they disagree. They, they argue about the age of the universe. It could be 14 billion years on the oldest side, and it could be 12 billion years at the younger side. That's a huge uncertainty, especially when both are saying, I know this as a fact. <laughs> so that's called the Hubble tension or the Hubble crisis. That's one of the biggest problems in cosmology, aside from the fact that we don't know anything about dark matter and we don't know anything about dark energy just yet. And <laughs> so these are huge things. Um, and yet, it's not like we don't know anything. We know the age of the universe to the equivalent of looking at you and saying, I know what, what day you were born, basically. So it's an incredible time to be a cosmologist. The more crises, the better. Bring them on, as long as they're not political.